Okay, we are really recording this time, Jules. Okay, take two. Welcome to the podcast. Today I'm joined by naturopath, blogger, online course facilitator, and fellow wellness coach podcaster, Jill Galloway. And she is here to rock our whole food world. Jules is on a mission to help tired women find their shine again and believe, believes people need to know the truth about real food as so many health problems can be changed with just a few dietary tweaks. So welcome to the show again, Jules. <laughs> uh, take two. It's very good to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. You are so welcome. Slight deja vu, but that's all good. Um, <laughs> I know. So if we could start from the beginning... And you can say that you know, you can say that bit about how I was an awesome guest on your show, blah blah blah. That's what we said last time when we were thought we were recording. <laughs> and we yeah, you um, did an awesome impression of your husband, which always yeah. cracks me up. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. Take two. All right. So, Jill, <laughs> tell us about how what, what your background was before you made the switch to to the whole food lifestyle. Yeah, well, I was a child of the 80s and I grew up in a standard Australian household. So you can imagine your wheat bix and milk, you know, white toast and jam kind of kid. And we just thought that was really normal. That's what everyone ate that we knew. We didn't know any Whole Foods people. We didn't know what Whole Foods were. And things took a, another turn, you know, in the health stakes when my dad was uh, diagnosed with high cholesterol. And... Of course, he was told that cholesterol was very, very bad and he needed to fix that straight away. Otherwise, he was definitely going to die. And so uh, he got put on a Pritikin diet, which was like a standard Australian diet, except add in the factors of like low fat, margarine instead of butter, um, skim milk instead of real milk. So it was basically a standard Australian diet, but worse. Um, so, yeah, it was awful. We were actually making skim milk from powder. And oh, thinking yeah. that that was healthier than real mm -hmm. milk. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, there's lots, lots of grains. Pritikin's very low fat and very grain heavy. And, and, you know, of course, we moved to like a multi-grain bread instead of white bread because we thought that was really that was healthy better. too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, and in the meantime, I was suffering from all the usual childhood illnesses but I was quite a sickly kid, so I was kind of copying it worse than most of the other kids at school. I was home from school a lot, but with really average childhood stuff. Like there were no serious diseases or anything, but I, I got glandular fever when I was six and then I had a recurrence of the glandular fever when I was seven. I had chronic tonsillitis, like recurrent tonsillitis. So rounds after rounds after rounds of antibiotics. Uh, I had problems with my ears. I had asthma. I had eczema. Uh, I was tired. I was catching every cold or flu that came along and they always went to my chest. So I can't even tell you how many chest x-rays I've had. It's actually frightening. And then rounds of antibiotics after antibiotics after antibiotics for chest infections. And this was my whole childhood and we just thought that was normal. And when we asked the doctor or we asked around, they basically went, oh, yeah, that's just normal childhood stuff. She just seems to get it worse than everyone else. It's probably because she's had glandular fever because, you know, immune system is a bit knocked around. And I continued to eat my standard Australian, very healthy, healthy, pretty can diet of, you know, wheat bix and Vegemite and skim milk and really the worst ice cream in the whole world made of skim milk. But, yeah, we still, we're still allowed to have sugar, I think, at that stage with lots of margarine. And, yeah, no one, no one knew any different. No one knew any different. And then... Uh, later on, when I was sort of early teenage years, my mum and my brother were diagnosed as celiac. Mm. So I had this really interesting insight into what it's like to have to eat a different diet and to not be understood because back in the 80s, no one knew what celiac was. In fact, there were even, and this is, this is a good thing to remember because, you know, these days, and I, I bang on a lot about things like pyrrole disorder and MTHFR and, you know, things that are coming up for people now. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had people, I've had clients with pyrrole disorder and I've experienced this myself where you will go to the doctor and they'll say, that doesn't exist. Well, I'll tell you right now, 
1987, when my mum and my brother went to the doctor and they would say that they had celiac disease, there were doctors out there that actually said, that celiac thing, that does not exist. Really? So it just shows that, that at every point in time, like we don't know everything. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really dangerous to say that something doesn't exist just because you don't know about it yet, mm -hmm. just because it's a new concept. So yeah, very early on, I got to see what it was like to have to eat a diet that was radically different to what everybody else was doing for, your, for the sake of your own health. Uh, and to have to deal with people not understanding what that was like. Mm -hmm. Like my, you know, we, like I said, we had a standard Australian diet. So our biggest concern was how is my brother going to be able to eat McDonald's? Oh. <laughs> you know, and that's, that was, that was like, oh my God, you can't eat bread. How are you going to go to McDonald's with your friends? <laughs> like this was a real concern. Oh, Molly. <laughs> and so, yeah, exactly. And it was like, well, if you don't have wheat bix or, muesli for breakfast what do you eat and so like we like those gluten-free breads that are everywhere now they didn't exist mm. back in those days mm. right i make it sound like the dark ages it was really only what 20 30 years ago but it it was different then we were mixing bread mixes by hand from scratch because there were no ready-made gluten-free breads available and yeah it was it was interesting to see how you know my brother and my mum were treated by people who just didn't understand that they couldn't eat this stuff. And for them, it was really strict. It wasn't a choice. It, it was, you can't eat this or you will, you know, oh, go God. to hospital. Yeah. 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 You'll get, you'll get very seriously yeah. ill. And, um, and my mum was one of those people that would get ill if she had a single crumb. So I spent yeah. a lot of my childhood years sitting on the edge of hospital beds waiting, you know, waiting for people to get better. Mm. Uh, so yeah. So that, that was my introduction into the medical system, which gave me, a very you know obviously now as a naturopath um i do work alongside doctors and medical practitioners when you know because sometimes we have to with patients going back and forth between the two models and i'm happy to work in with them but at, at that time it gave me a, just that little bit of doubt in my mind that modern medicine could answer everything and could fix everything because it certainly couldn't fix my family and mm -hmm. actually what happened is they all got worse. Everyone's health got worse. So the Pritikin didn't work, you know, the, the every, nothing was working, nothing was working. And so what I saw was a really sick group of people. And of course my own health flew under the radar because while everyone else had these, you know, legit diseases going on, <laughs> there was Joan with a chest infection and a tonsillitis yeah. and whatnot. Like I was the least sick out of everyone. So I just under the radar. Um, but I also, I, I didn't have the most wonderful childhood. So at 16, I left home mm -hmm. and I, as most teenagers would do at that stage in life, if they had, you know, had that sort of upbringing leading up to leaving, leaving, bleh, leaving home, I went completely off the rails. <laughs> so when I was 16, I moved into a, a youth accommodation that happened to be within 200 metres of a KFC, a Hungry Jack's, a Red Rooster, a McDonald's and a really awesome fish and chip shop. So I didn't learn how to cook. Mm, the only I'm thing I could cook was two-minute noodle. Oh. I could cook two-minute noodles with country harvest and a slice of cheese if, you know, if Oz Study had come through. It was like, oh, we'll make this really gourmet and we'll put cheese in there. Gourmet. Right? Like, gourmet. I don't, you know, I don't actually craft, think that... Your craft single. I don't think that's actually classed as cooking as a Jill's, like just two minute noodles. I don't know. We used to stir through. I remember. I don't know. Food. There was boiling water. There was boiling water. Woo! Boil the kettle. That's boiling the kettle, not cooking. Boiling water. I remember. That's I remember having the two minute noodles. It was when I was flatting with some um, some people when I first moved to Perth, and one of the boys there used to call it gourmet noodles by adding some broccoli to the two minute <laughs> noodles, and they were gourmet noodles. <laughs> we would now call that something vaguely healthy in your otherwise not very healthy noodle dish. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so wow. so grace, you, if you will. So you were feasting on fast food, at, living out of home from the age of 16. Yep. Alcohol and other associated substances. Yep. Uh, so... Yeah, it was the perfect storm for a really, really dodgy gut 
which is what happened a few years down the track. So if you fast forward a few years and I, you know, wasn't, I wasn't homeless anymore. I was, I was at a point where I was living in share houses and working, uh, but the groundwork had not been done. I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know how to eat. So I was still living on convenience foods. Uh, but, and, and my idea of cooking then was making pancakes out of shake and bake bottle or something. So it, it wasn't looking good for me. Oh. Um, and I had, I had gut problems. I had candida problems, like, you know, some of the, some of the worst candida issues that, that anyone had ever seen. Like I was sent to a specialist. I was given, you know, that, that candida tablet that they give you, yeah. um, that's supposed to be a one off. I was giving like, I was given like a three month course of that. And like every day for three months and, and then I was sent back to the specialist and then I was given another three month course. It was, it was horrendous. And that stuff like knocks around your liver, like no one's business. Mm. And so it was just, I kept being placed back behind the eight ball health wise and things just got worse. So like, you know, now it wasn't so much, you know, there was a bit of gut stuff. There was a bit of, you know, there's a lot of candida stuff, but now we were starting to go in down that mental health track as well, because obviously if your gut's unhealthy for that long a time, then what may happen is that you, your neurotransmitters aren't being produced properly and your mental health might start to become affected. So this is, you know, you think about it, still not eating well, still unhealthy gut, still got stuff in the gut that needs to be weeded out, um, definite lack of nutrition, partying really 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 hard still and that's when the anxiety and the depression started to creep up and it was more anxiety uh but yeah it was it was just at this point where little thing after little thing after little thing started to get worse and it's like where do you go from there where do you go so i was actually really really lucky that i happened to uh come across a naturopath who did some testing and said, okay, you can't have gluten, you can't have dairy. Uh, and there were, and, and there were, we, we looked at sugar and that was a big no-no uh, because of the candida. But yeah. if it wasn't for seeing a naturopath at that point, like I was trying to be healthier, but I was still doing things that weren't right for my body. So I was like, okay, I know not to eat white bread. By this stage, I'd done a bit of research. I knew not to eat white bread but I was just eating like sourdough whole meal bread instead. And I knew not to eat two minute noodles, but I was buying like, you know, your whole wheat sober noodles instead. Mm. But what I didn't realize is the damage had already been done and I already had this raging, you know, gluten intolerance and dairy intolerance. And, you know, I wasn't drinking skim milk anymore. I was having whole milk, but it wasn't right for me. And so once I had these food allergies, sorry, food intolerances pinpointed, that was a massive turning point for me. And, you know, I had to learn how to cook and how to eat. And I had, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was just wondering, what, what age were you at at this point when you saw the naturopath? Um, what were you in your 20s, 30s? Early 20s, early 20s. Fine. okay. How lucky were you to actually find somebody then? Because a lot of the things that you've mentioned, although they're, they're not, I mean, you and I have had this conversation before, they're common, they're not normal. But there'll be so many people. I mean, I'm nodding along with a lot of the things that you said that I can relate back to my health story as well. And I bet a lot of yeah. the listeners are going, yeah, I've got tonsillitis all the time. Yeah, chest infections. Yeah, candida issues in my 20s. Um, so it's, it's a very like a very common cycle, isn't it? But a lot of people yeah. don't even realize it till like their late 30s, late 40s when that mental, you know, they've had all of the gut issues and all the causes of antibiotics and being on the pill, then had a couple of babies, and then like just that mental time of, it, of, of the busyness, and then they just collapse in their 40s. So I reckon you are like yeah. mega, mega lucky to, to get this um, pinpointed so young. Absolutely, and if I hadn't have pinpointed it in my early 20s, I would have been going down the path of medication. I would have definitely have been on some sort of anti-anxiety meds, some you know possibly some sort of antidepressant and from there who knows because I, I think what a lot of people in Australia don't realize right now that I think is going to come to light in the next few years because I know people are starting to wake up and understand that all of those illnesses and issues that I mentioned they don't happen in isolation like the chest infection and the tonsillitis 
is part of the same process as the candida and the anxiety, right? So yeah, right. just because those things all happen 15 years apart from each other doesn't mean they're separate problems. They were all part of the same problem because once we dealt with the food intolerances, the leaky gut, once we started doing the gut healing, taking out the foods I shouldn't be eating, then all of those things started to get better. So magically, like the anxiety was helped, but suddenly I went, oh, I haven't had a chest infection this winter. Yeah. What's funny about that. Yeah, so amazing. you never know. <laughs> You never know what might be connected. And this is, this is why when people come to me and they've got kids who've got, you know, they've got asthma and they've got ear infections and they've got some sort of skin issue and then they've got something else in a completely different part of the body. It's like sometimes it's about educating people that's actually all part of one bigger issue. If we get that one bigger issue and sort that out, some of these other things just come online just by themselves. That's, yeah. that's, a, you know, that's obviously the perfect outcome, but you never know. I used to get chronic headaches and then once I started eating a different way, they magically disappeared. Now those chronic headaches, I mean, they were just like a, a headache that I got most days of the week, maybe five or so days a week at about three or four in the afternoon, always would get this headache mm. and try drinking more water and that wasn't it. And then I went, oh, well, I'll just take Panadol. So I just took Panadol and when I started eating this way, magically the headaches went away. And I was like, oh, I wouldn't have even gone and asked for help with that. But no. you know, I, it, it was like you never, ever know what else is going to come online once, once you start eating a certain way. And sometimes those things will be the motivators while you're waiting for the chest infections to clear up or while you're waiting because, you know, coming back from something like anxiety takes a long time as well. So while you're waiting for those things, it's really wonderful when something shows you that you're on the right track, like the headaches going away. It's like, mm. ah, okay, there's something going on here. This is good. We can see change happening. This keeps you motivated. So, you, so you're, you're treating the root cause um, of all of the, like you're saying, all of these different things that are related, whereas while you were a child, the, the doctors had been treating the symptoms of each of these um, you know, ways that your body was saying, hang on a minute, Thing, something's not quite right so you know like you're saying the headaches and stuff so they just went miraculously what do you what do you um account that to like why do you think that happened i have to say that as naturopaths i don't think we're allowed to say that we treat the root cause but i think we're allowed to say that we address it okay uh, because we don't we don't treat, okay. <laughs> we don't treat. um yeah we definitely address things and we definitely manage things um so, sorry, what was the question? The... I was just wondering if you could explain why things like headaches and, and other, all those other symptoms that you had, why did they go when you, when you change, why did they go when you changed your diet? There was obviously inflammation that was happening in the body that was being driven by the food intolerances. So when, when, you're, when you eat food that you're intolerant to, if it doesn't agree with you, uh, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of other follow on issues that can happen in the body. Um, and one of those is systemic inflammation. So the, another one that, that came online when I started eating better was the joint pain. Like I had terrible pain in my knees in my early twenties and they were going to send me for arthroscopic surgery to try and find out what was going on. Then I started eating gluten free and magically the knee pain went away. So there's a lot of inflammation that, that goes on with food intolerances if you continue to eat the food that, that doesn't agree with you. And as you start to heal the gut, you're also helping to heal the immune system because the gut, you know, the immune system is created in the gut. So much of it is, is, is created right there. And if the gut is not healthy, then the immune system doesn't come online in the, in the correct way. So you need the immune system to be healthy in order to bring down the inflammation as well. So it, everything really is connected by the gut. The gut is where it's at. If you don't know what else to do, you start in the gut. You heal the gut first and then just see what else needs to be done after that. Yeah, all right. So you, you talked about joint pain. You talked about headaches. Uh, what, what other ways would chronic inflammation present in somebody's body? Oh, so many ways. I guess that the most common one I see in women, especially sort of aged in the 30s and 40s, would be fatigue. Mm. Uh, just that, you know, real garden variety, can't put your finger on it, fatigue, like wake up tired, never feels refreshed, 
mm. hitting the wall at three, four in the afternoon. Uh, you know, that, that can actually be a sign that there's systemic inflammation going on throughout the body. Um, I've talked about the immune system. We've talked about joint pain. We've talked about all of that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, inflammation in, systemically in the body can take so many forms. It can, it can, you know, if it's in your digestive system, it's going to prevent your absorption of all the nutrients that you're eating. Mm. So if you've got, in, you know, inflammation in the gut, then maybe you're not absorbing the beautiful nutrients that you ate with your lunch and all that kale just went to waste. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know what what happens then is that you might get you know um nutrient deficiencies and so sometimes like when people have inflammation you see that their hair their skin and their nails aren't looking what they used to be either so it, it can really present in in so many different ways and um as you would know from you know doing a lot of reading around sort of the paleo primal traps and 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 that sort of you know that sort of community that so many conditions, uh, health conditions have been linked to inflammation now and continue to be so, and not just physical, but, you know, mental, emotional as well. Mm, yeah, that's right. Um, so when you, when you did change your diet back there, when you saw the naturopath and you got off the gluten, um, is, is, that a, is that a similar uh, uh, way of eating that you, that you follow now? Can you tell us a bit more about um, what you changed and um, and how you did it and how that looks these days? Yeah, it ebbed and flowed for a long time. I lived in Melbourne and, uh, you know, it's a very foodie orientated mm -hmm. culture down there. And I must say that while I was living down there, I went through periods of being strict and then I went through periods of really not being strict and going, oh, well, I've been gluten-free for six days, but my friend wants to go out for pizza and I'll go out for pizza with my friend. And mm. or we're at this pub and there's no gluten-free options on the menu. So I'll just make do and eat a burger. And I found that when I lived down there, um, I wasn't surrounded by like-minded people in terms of the food that we ate. Uh, so no one else in my friendship group was really gluten-free, uh, dairy-free, sugar-free. So I was kind of on my own in that regard. So I, I, I had a bit of a rubbery arm and I found <laughs> that sometimes I would cave in. So, um, I, you know, I went through periods where I had to be strict. Like I did an eight-week anti-candida diet, which is the best thing that I ever did. It was like beautiful big liver cleansing anti-candida number. Mm. And that, that, was, that, that worked wonders for me. Uh, but then afterwards, I, you know, I could get away with stuff again. So it would just mm. kind of creep back in. Like it would be like just a, you know, a croissant here and then a, a bagel there. And next thing you know, you're eating gluten four days a week and you didn't even realise. So it wasn't until we moved to Byron Bay, which was a completely different culture, completely different community, uh, that I really started to eat the way that I should be eating. And so that was about five or six years ago now that we moved here. And Every cafe has gluten and dairy-free options. Every cafe or every good cafe. Yeah. Uh, most of the friends that I met had similar, you know, similar ideas and philosophies around food. So my closest friends were paleo, so that made it easy. <laughs> uh, you didn't have to explain to people what, what, it, what you could and couldn't eat. In fact, it's, it's a bit of a running joke up here that, like, everyone will have some sort of thing, you know, like, and we'd all sit down to, to eat. And so you'd have a vegetarian at the table, you'd have a vegan at the, at the table, you'd have a paleo person at the table, you'd have, you know, someone else, someone else, someone else. So, yeah, everyone had their own, their own uh, food philosophy, but everyone that I was meeting was quite conscious about what they ate and doing, you know, doing their best to find out what worked for them and to eat that way. So, yeah, it's a different level of support when you've got people around you like that. It's, it's just so much easier to stick to stuff if you don't have your mates trying to bend your rubbery arm yeah and yeah and i guess that's that's also just a change of the um a sign of the times as well isn't it because when you did you know back when you were doing your gluten-free back in the 80s that was like completely um you know cranky yeah. and quirky and whereas now like if you almost unusually well you, if you do just stick to a, a standard australian diet because there are so many other options out there like like you said paleo and gluten-free and and vegan and um and it's great that there is so much more 
um, options out there for us. But just going back to, obviously, you've had to explain your different dietary um, plans to a lot of people like throughout the years. Do you have any advice? Because that's one thing I hear a lot from um, my community is that how do you explain what you're doing to people? Like, what do you do? Do you have a way of calling it um, your way of eating? I guess these days uh, it is possible that my reputation precedes me a little bit so <laughs> I don't have to explain myself. In <laughs> fact, people sometimes actually, I have the opposite problem where uh, people assume that I don't drink wine and that I don't drink coffee and things like that because they think that I'm so super healthy because I've got this health blog and I'm like, no, 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 please feed me wine. I like wine. And so <laughs> yeah, I, it's kind of almost gone the other way at the moment. Um, I find, I find that I'm really having to explain myself less and less, but that could be again, the community that I'm in and the company that I keep people here are just so used to hearing it. Mm. They don't question it. They don't, okay. I, you know, it's been a long time since someone's gone, so what is this gluten-free? Why would you do that? But, you know, in, in Melbourne, that was pretty common. So I, I think I have definitely changed the groups that I, that I, you know, that I interact with. But if you are just starting out and your friends and family don't get you because, you know, we, we live in a bubble, Helen. No, we, no. we live in a complete bubble where we are surrounded by like-minded people. And, and if you are new and starting out and you're watching this, just know that once you've been doing this for a while, those like-minded people turn up right they do they turn up and they grow so you, you feel like you're alone at first but you won't be alone for very long because like attracts like and they do they just come into your life or people around you will notice that you're looking really healthy and they'll ask you what you've done yeah. and then you'll be like oh all i did was go paleo or go primal or go, go gluten free or whatever it is for you and then they might even try it you never know i know people who've got their sisters on board and their mums on board and that stuff takes time and patience, uh, especially with mums, I've found. But <laughs> you never know who might be popping their head up next to do what you're doing. So just stick with it. Stick to your truth and, and know that if it's right for you, then you have every right to do it. You absolutely have every right to do it. But if people ask you, you just I just keep it really simple. And I, I, say, I would say, look, I eat this way because I've you know, I've had tests done and there's foods that don't agree with me and I eat this way because it's, it, it keeps me healthy. And you if I don't eat that, this yeah. way, yeah, if I don't eat this way, like, you know, and that's the thing between allergies and intolerances and celiac and intolerances. And I know a lot of the gluten-free community, there's like this big barrier down the middle and you either can't have a crumb or you're one of those annoying people that are gluten-free but then cave and have a piece of toast. Oh, you know, do you have gluten-free options? Oh, all right, I'll just have a croissant. And those people get really upset at those people sometimes because they're like, you're ruining it for us because we can't have a crumb. <laughs> and there, there you are ordering the gluten-free meal and then having a bite of your boyfriend's sandwich and you're wrecking mm. it for us. And it's like, all right, all right, everybody calm down. We're all working towards better health. But I understand there's some people that don't get that choice. Yeah, yeah. And so... As a person who has intolerances, if I had a crumb, I'm fine. If I had a croissant, I'm actually pretty much fine. If I ate three croissants and a slice of bread, I'll be sick, right? Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, I am that annoying person who can have a bite of my husband's lunch if I really, really wanted to. Mm -hmm. So what I just say to people is, look, if I have, you know, I've got, I've, I've got these food intolerances, and if I have a lot of that food, I get really, really sick. If I have a little bit, I'll probably be okay. But I save that little bit for special occasions mm. or for times that I get really, really caught out or when I'm traveling. <laughs> but yeah. the rest of the time, I need to stick to it because this is what's best for my health. That's right. And, you know, you, you can now that you're like so far into your journey, you can now, like you say, have the wine and, and have the occasional croissant and really enjoy that. And I and, um, and know that, you know, you yes, three croissants and a slice of bread is not going to be a good option, but one croissant <laughs> now and again is, is all right. Um, but maybe that wouldn't have been all right when you were doing your candida cleanse. Back no, in the day. no, no. You've got a little, no, and um, I, I, you've got a nice, I can't remember what you called it. Um, but I heard it on another podcast that you did. It's something about meeting the, uh, the, that the, 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 
how strict you are with your diet needs to match the pace of your illness. Yes. That. So if you're, <laughs> if you're really strict, then so does your diet. So is your diet for now. That's it. That's how it has to be. If you are in the throes of IBS, candida, asthma, eczema, you know, all of those things, if you've got, you know, if you've got major health issues, if you've got an autoimmune problem, if, you know, if you've got no time to spare, then you need to be really strict. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're not getting better, then you might need to be really strict. But once you are feeling better, you might not need to be quite so strict all the time. Because think about it, like, some, you know, when we were younger, sometimes we could get away with eating these foods. And it's mm -hmm. only because we ate so much of those foods and our guts got so broken by eating the foods and maybe environmental factors, maybe it was antibiotics, who knows what it was for you. There's so many, there are so many different reasons why guts can have problems. It's not just about whether it was antibiotics or whatever. There's environmental factors, there's stress, there's all kinds of things. So, you know, if, if, your, if your gut is healed, then you might get away with a little bit. You never know. And save that little bit for the thing that you really love. Like, or save it for when you're traveling and mm -hmm. there really aren't any other options. Like save it for when it really means something. Um, because once that gut's healed, there is that temptation to just go back to eating the way you used to eat. But you might find that that would become a slippery slope. But yeah, you might be able to sneak in a little bit here and there if you're lucky. You might find the desire to sneak a little bit in here and there goes away after a while as well. Yeah. yeah. You never know. Yeah, you never know. So what does a typical day yeah. of, what does a typical um, Jules a day look like in terms of what you guys eat? Yeah, so I I live in a fairly warm area. You wouldn't know it today because it is actually winter, but winter really only lasts in Byron for about six weeks. <laughs> uh, but it, it's usually pretty warm here. So a typical day for me would usually start with a smoothie uh, and that smoothie would have a fair bit of protein in it, whether it's like a quarter of a cup of cashews or whether it's like a, a serve of sprouted fermented rice protein powder, because I'm not 100% paleo. I'm about 80% paleo. with So I'm like paleo with a bit of rice and a bit of wine. Um, so <laughs> That's my kind of paleo. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best kind. Yeah. So, yeah, so I start the day with a smoothie uh, that's got, you know, that's packed with protein. If it's the weekend, I'll probably be starting the day with like, eggs or some sort of you know um egg thing out like a you know eggs and spinach and tomato and mushrooms and bacon or something like that mm -hmm. uh so yeah that that's that's breakfast sorted i work from home so lunch is whatever's in the fridge so i have to make sure that what's in, what's available that i can make in less than 15 minutes is going to be good because mm -hmm. sometimes i'm grabbing a meal in between clients or whatever because i see a lot of clients via skype so I'll be running into the kitchen in between Skype consults going, right, what's in the fridge, what's in the fridge? So I have a lot of leftovers for lunch from the night before. So I quite often have roast veggies, salad sitting around. Um, if I've eaten chicken the night before, there might be a little bit still cut up. Uh, I do a lot of boiled eggs to go with the salads and the veggies uh, because they're quick and I can boil them the night before or in the morning. Uh, yeah, I forgot the coffee. Mid-morning, usually have coffee. I have coffee five or six days a week and I have a coffee-free day every week, most weeks, at least one because mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't like it when it gets to that point where you get a headache if you haven't had coffee. Yes. I think that's a, bit, that's a bit dodged. So I always make sure I have a day off every week. Uh, so, yeah, lunch is usually leftovers. Um, and then dinner is meat and veggies fish and veggies or salad, um, lots of roast dinners and slow cooked meals. Like I'll do a big slow cooked meal on the weekend in the big pot um, and then divvy it up. So lots of slow cooked lamb, uh, beef. During the week it's more likely to be chicken because that's done faster. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I always do leftovers. Like I always have one of those big, I don't have a slow cooker anymore. I just didn't like the slow cooker so much. I've got yeah. an electric stove and the big Le Creuset pot, you know, the big red pot. Mm, yeah, and I does. just do like massive, yeah, massive one pot meals in there. Um, but then in summer, then we'll eat more fish, veggies, chicken, you know, salad. Well, those like, uh, 
Yeah, I don't know what it is uh, about. Um, I don't know what it is about slow cookers, but yeah. everything sort of tends to taste the same in there. It's quite bland, isn't it, and watery. And whereas yeah. those like nice cast iron pots that we've got, I don't know, it just seems to get more. I don't know, gusto yeah. into it. Yeah, I think it's more tasty. Yeah, it's because it's got the history of what's been cooked in there for so long, and it gives you this feeling of being very <laughs> European. I don't know what it is. No, I think I think with slow cookers, there's also that danger that that you'll throw in the onions and the garlic without frying them off. Mm. So I think with slow cooker culture, a lot of people think they can just chuck it all in the pot, add the water and walk away. Mm. But I find then if I'm using the big red pot on the stove, I fry off the onions and I fry the garlic. And so you get that oil in and you get the spices going. Then you add your water or stock. Yeah. And it's that caramelization that gives you the flavor. And also, I find that if I just added the onions or the garlic and didn't fry them off, they definitely do different things to my digestion. And Mm. I'm not sure why I've been meaning to look into it, but I find that once they've been fried off with a bit of oil and they go translucent, then they seem to be easier to digest. But if you just chuck it in a soup and boil crap out of it, it seems to be, you know, a bit rougher on the digestive system. So That's I've got to really find out whether... That's really interesting. That's really interesting because yeah. I, I experienced the same thing, but not like, yeah, same thing. So if I've, um, you know, sauteed some onions, made dinner with it, that's fine. But if I just do a soup in the Thermomix and, and then have yeah. that, I get, I get bloated and farty, to be honest, Jules. That's what happens to me with yeah. that. Yeah, I, I, we have to look into whether that's a thing because I haven't yeah. I haven't actually done the research, but I know myself if it's done, you know, if it's sautéed in the oil, mm. then that seems to take a lot of that that out of it um, and make it, you know, more digestible. So mm. hey, maybe it is a thing. Well, I know that out. you know when you do this when you do the spices in the oil, it activates the spices, mm. not just activating the taste but it also can activate like the medicinal properties you know Mm -hmm. if you do the turmeric in the oil we know that that makes the turmeric you know more absorbable in terms of its medicinal properties so Mm -hmm. hey maybe maybe because you look back at how people would traditionally cook with onions and garlic and those sorts of sulfury things and they would they would always fry it off before adding the rest of the meat and the stock or whatever so yeah traditional cooking we, we need to get back to traditional oh. cooking. I know thermomixers and slow cookers are amazing. Absolutely love them. But maybe there's a couple of things that we need to do slightly differently just to make things more digestible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've never thought about that. Um, never thought about that before. So we need, we need to find out if that's a thing. And also, I don't know if you find yeah. this, but after, you know, I work from home as well and have a lot of, you know, meetings like this in front of the computer and, and you know, the days can be quite exciting and, and full on, but there's something about when you come to the stove on a night and you start chopping vegetables and it's a very grounding. Do you find yeah. that too? Yeah. Yeah. It depends what mindset you've got going into it though, isn't it? Doesn't it? Because it's, it's not like every night. If you're sometimes it's just another No, thing. <laughs> if it's like shit, I've got to get this done and you know, husband, why don't you do this? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if you go into it mindfully chopping the things without having other thoughts and think, you know, having the phone on or having something, you know, the laptop open or something, then it is, it is, there's a lot to be said for mindful cooking. I think it brings down the cortisol levels. Um, But yeah, it, it has to be approach in that mindful space rather than just get the shit done. Yeah. And then we'll relax later when the kids are in bed, you know, but meanwhile, busy, busy, busy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you've already told, yeah. you've already told us you work from home. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how a Jules w- a week or a day looks in terms of um, whether you fit in? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you fitting? Did someone tell me what? Yeah. Any ma- do you need to do one of your own courses, Jules, to get this one? Oh, uh, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, yeah. Look, I I have a little bit of routine now uh, to my business, so it it never used to have routine, and that did start to give me a bit of adrenal fatigue uh, because you're just constantly putting out fires buzzing around everywhere. So. Uh, I do have a bit of routine now uh, and on Mondays, Wednesdays and Saturdays, I see clients. So they're my client days. They're the days when I'm in that, that client headspace. They're the days that I'm 
you know, most likely to also be looking at test results in between clients and sending client emails and all that sort of stuff. So they're the days where I'm really fully engaged with the people that I'm looking after at the moment in my practice. Mm -hmm. I see clients either from home or via phone or Skype. And to be honest, phone and Skype are 90% of my business. It's very rarely that I see people you know, from home, from, from clinic here. So I've got a room um, in my house that is my clinic room for local people because I'm, I'm in Bangalore near Byron Bay. But, you know, I also have clients in, you know, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, WA, out in the mines, out right out in Western Australia. I've got clients in um, uh, Germany, France, <laughs> everywhere. Amazing. Everywhere. Yeah. So... Yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing being able to see people via Skype. So they're, they're my client days. Uh, and on the other days, I'm either podcasting, blogging, um, food photography, uh, you know, social media. There's a lot, of, a lot of work goes into social media. It yeah. may not look like it, but it is. It, it's, it's very time consuming. I've actually got two social media accounts now, one for my naturopath business and one for a side project that I'm doing called be body happy which is all about body positivity and body confidence mm. so yeah I've, I've got two things going on now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so my my days are quite full I'm also running a program for adrenal fatigue called the adrenal fatigue breakthrough and that's a, a premium level program for women who really want to engage and 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 start to become healthier so that's quite intense. Like we have weekly, weekly coaching calls and we have a lot of one-on-one consultations that happen as part of that program as well, as well as a thriving Facebook group. So that, that takes up a lot of my days as well. So yeah, that it doesn't, that there's not much left at, at the end of that week. Is there? <laughs> no, it's a pretty, pretty busy. And, but you know, by um, you're, you're passionate. This is your passion, Jill, isn't it? And there's really something about, um, um, doing what you know following your dreams and doing what you love that is in itself an adventure and fun and play and healing as opposed to you know being a slave to a job that you absolutely um, can't stand so I think it's very important to, to do a job oh, yeah. never again never never again but you know in in between all that blogging and podcasting and seeing clients and managing groups and all of that sort of stuff in and around all of that i make sure there's plenty of fun as well and um when i do schedule in my time you know into i i have done planners before i just tend to not stick to them very well but when i've done mm-hmm. planners before the fir- the first thing i did was put in the client days and the surfing right so i was right. like right this is when I'm going to go for a surf on, on Tuesday or Thursday or Wednesday, or whatever it was. It was like, these are the days that I go for a surf. These are the days that I see clients. Okay. Mm. Now what are we left? What mm. are we left with? Okay. Well, that's Love when the, the blogging and the podcasting happens. I'll schedule in the yoga classes. Um, I will take time out to go and have long lunches once a week or once a fortnight with girlfriends or like-minded people. There's a lot of wellness entrepreneurs in this area Mm. and so there's always people to catch up with and really you know talk you know have these amazing juicy wonderful lunch conversations with and coffees with so don't worry i make sure i have time for all of that stuff because if you don't have time for all of that stuff what is the point of doing this what is the point of working for yourself because it is a it is a lot of work it is a big job so if you're not passionate about it and you don't make time to do the things that make you happy then you might as well go back and work nine to five. And that's what I don't want to do. I'm a terrible employee anyway. Terrible. No, no one will want me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it for a second. But no, that, that's absolutely right, isn't it? You, you've got to be, um, yeah, doing what you love and still making time to do all of those things. And, you know, like having a lunch with your well wellness friends might sound like, uh, oh, that's all right for you. But actually, it's really important, especially when you work from home, you're a solopreneur, to actually get out in the real world and connect with real people and be inspired. It's almost like networking as well, isn't it? When you, when you get together with people like that, you know, in terms of ideas for your business and things that you can help each other out with. So I love it. Sounds like you've just yeah. got a very inspiring <laughs> balance. I know it's, there's no such thing as balance, but you've got some, some cool balancing 
happen in there, Jill. So you, you have to. And honestly, when, when you work from home in the way that I do, honestly, if you don't have those coffee dates out with people, like what, what's your incentive to actually get out of your pyjama pants? Like seriously, you could go. You could go a whole day without leaving the house. Uh, so get, that that stuff's for sanity. You get inspired to get out of your pajama pants when your um, podcasting friend tells you that it's going to be actually an audio <laughs> video call. <laughs> yeah, look, I put jeans <laughs> on for you and everything. I've got, I've got real Ooh. shoes. Then they're, they're not even UGG boots today. Like this I've is this is what I've done on. for you. You only need to get ready up here. Yeah, you know, I've got no bra on, UGG boots on, dirty trousers. <laughs> No one cares. No one cares. No one cares. No, no one cares. No one cares. As long as the talk is good. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, Jill, you've already told us you've got to practice. You can work with people on Skype. Tell us a little bit. I know you've, you've touched on a little bit about your adrenal fatigue course, which just sounds amazing. Can you tell like, a, us a little bit more about who that might be suitable for? It would be suitable for any woman who has got to a point in her life where she's feeling burned out and she knows she needs to eat better. Oh, hang on, I'm talking to you, right? <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're somewhere between 30 and 50 years old, you might have a couple of kids, you might not, um, and you feel burned out and you don't have that spark you used to have. Like it's just flatlined everything everything's just you're grinding everything out through the day so if you feel like you used to have more energy and you want that back if you feel like you're being grumpy at your hubby or your kids and you don't want to be anymore and if you want to get back to old you that was happier and more vibrant and felt alive then come and see me Wow. Come and see like, me. We'll get probably like everyone who's listening, I would say. Listening I know. I know, right? No, no, one one bloke's just one bloke's hit no. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one bloke's just gone to tell his wife to do it. No, um, yeah, yeah. look seriously, the the women that I love to work with, they know what they need to do, but they're not doing it. And mm. they know they need to eat gluten, dairy and sugar free. But like I said earlier, it just keeps sneaking back in, sneaking back in. Mm. So the, the person I love to work with is someone who's aware of what needs to happen, but really needs help to make it happen in a way that isn't going to cost them time and oodles of money mm. where I, I want to make it easy for people. I show you how to cook. I show you what prep to do the day before we get it happening so that meals don't take too long to make. Like it'll be faster to make a dinner with me than it is to actually go and get takeaway pizza from somewhere. Like it's actually faster to cook you know, what, I, what I get you to cook. So we just we do it in a way that's sustainable as well so that it, this isn't about just punching out 12 weeks of a program and then going back to the way you used to be. This is about making lasting changes that you're actually going to stick to so that you stay well. Sounds amazing. So if people want to, um, if people want to get on this course, where do we, where would we go? The first thing you can do is go to my website and it's at julesgalloway.com. And what you'll find there is a little giveaway on the, it's usually on the right hand side, unless you're on a mobile, you might have to scroll down a bit and it's a free little guide to healing your adrenals. It's just a little beginner's guide to get you in the right mindset thinking about putting yourself first and giving you some actionable steps to start nurturing your, your, yourself and to nourish your adrenals again. So from there, if you are interested in doing the course, um, you can email me uh, via the website. So just like I said, go to julesgalloway.com. There is a contact page there as well. And if you contact me about the course, I'll get back to you and send you a link so that we can have a little discovery call and see whether it's right for you. Sounds awesome. And I know you've also got another couple of courses as well, Seven Days to Gluten-Free. And what is the other ones that you've got? The other one is Shiny Healthy You, but they are not going to be around for much longer in their current forms. Okay. So, yeah, nice. they're, they're actually, they're, they're not going to be happening so much in the future. I am really going to be focused on the Adrenal Fatigue Breakthrough because I'm finding that I want, I want women who are really willing and able and ready to make the changes, who are really engaged, who want to make mm. this happen. 
and I find with those other courses they're wonderful and you know they've got great recipes in them and all Mm. that sort of stuff but I find that what has been missing from those is the accountability and that's why I've created this new course so it's going to take the best from both of those old courses and roll it into this new system where we have weekly coaching calls and we have accountability sessions so we're we're in touch in a way that you know that you can't be when you're running a course for like 300 people at once yeah absolutely absolutely no it sounds it sounds um sounds fantastic and um if and i think it's just really great that you want to get these people who are are ready to take action and really it's nothing they couldn't do achieve on their own but they just you're just taking them from a to b in a faster way and and making sure that you're sealing in some good habits for them so that when they finish the course they can carry that on um, in the rest of their life fantastic yeah yeah, and it creates community. I think the things that are missing at the moment that are stopping people from achieving their goals are community and accountability. So I think that's where it's at. Perfect, perfect. And meanwhile, if you want to get your hands on more jewels, you can check out her awesome podcast on Shiny Health, Shiny Healthy You, which is on the wellness couch, and she's got heaps of episodes there. Um, which are t- ready to download whenever you want. So, Jules, thanks so much for being on the show today. It's totally <laughs> exciting to have you here. And uh, just before um, you go, guys, um, if you want to create a business from your passion for real food, then why not go out and check out the Primalista license? Um, the Primalista license um, enables you to produce paleo food for your convenience craving community and help them stop falling off the wagon. To find out more about the Primalista license, head to www.primalalternative.com. But from Jules and I, it's over and out. Au revoir. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.